I want an ultrasonic homogenizer. These are great little tools that can be used to quickly pop open cells to release proteins and DNA, or they can produce emulsions that never separate, and can produce flashes of sonoluminescent light if they have enough power. Normally, you buy the kilowatt ones, which will cost well over a grand, which for a tool I'm only going to use a couple of times probably wasn't worth the investment. But now I've got a tool that can make anything, so I just built myself one instead. To get this started, here's a quick tour of an ultrasonic generator. First, there's a piezoelectric crystal called a transducer that will shrink and contract as we put electricity through it. By changing the polarity quickly, we can make it vibrate thousands of times per second, producing ultrasonic waves. And the more power we put into it, the more it will shrink and contract during each cycle. All this motion is fed into what's called a horn, which is a big hunk of metal that takes these vibrations and focuses it the same way a lens focuses light. If we make the horn flare, it'll spread the vibrations over a larger area, but make them weaker. And if we make the horn pointy, it focuses and concentrates the vibrations, making them stronger over a much smaller area. The transducers I'm starting with are normally used for ultrasonic baths, the same kind you would use to clean jewelry, though mine are meant for an industrial cleaner. In this case, these are 60 watt transducers that are supposed to vibrate at about 40 kilohertz, or 40,000 vibrations per second. I bought mine with a matching driver circuit that produces the high power electrical oscillations needed to get the transducer to run. The horn on the stock transducers flare out because they're built to shake an entire bath of water, but for the homogenizer, we want to concentrate that energy down as much as we can, so I chucked up one of the transducers in the lathe. In this old Tony's video, he was able to get his apart, but mine were glued together and wouldn't budge, so I'm machining this all as one piece. Be careful if you try this, piezoelectricity works both ways, so the forces on the piezo make it generate a high voltage charge that really hurts if you get shocked by it. I've probably gotten zapped six or seven times throughout this whole build. First up was to get rid of the flare of the transducer so it's just a nice cylinder and take a facing cut to remove the rough surface. For the sake of demonstration, and because I was playing with different shapes, I modified a second transducer this way as well, but unlike what you're about to see, made no further modifications to it. The original plan was to just make something that looked nice, which turned out to be a pretty bad idea, but worked out in the end after some tuning and reshaping. So with the help of my engineer friend, we designed an insert that would thread into the hole in the front of the transducer. The idea was to use this to focus most of the energy down, and then drill and tap a hole in the end so we could have the ability to swap out different bits, like a homogenizer tip or blade. Also, we were designing based on the stock we had around the workshop, which played a big role in our choice of diameters, lengths, angles, and such. So I went about making the insert, starting with the threaded end first, as the part would be awkward to grip once we started cutting the taper. We just used an M10 die to cut the thread, since we didn't want to mess with the gearing in the lathe to try and cut them. Then the part was flipped around, remounted, and the rest of the shape was turned. First the basic profile, and then the 15 degree taper. Finally, the end was drilled and then tapped. What ended up being really lucky was that we happened to drill this hole way deeper than was actually needed, and this ended up saving the day down the line when this nub was removed for tuning. With the insert done, we can return to the horn of the transducer to finish the basic shape. This time we cut a much steeper angle, with the idea being to reduce the end diameter to match the diameter of the threaded insert we just made. I would just thread the insert in to check the progress, as well as taking repeated measurements. You can see that the insert doesn't sit quite flat. This was due to an error when we were cutting the threads, which, while ugly, didn't affect the final performance of the horn that much. And finally, to finish this first draft of the horn, we made a little aluminum piece to fit into the end that had a final diameter of about 3.5 millimeters. The idea being was that this was the size needed to fit into the bottom of an Eppendorf tube. Now at this point I knew nothing about ultrasonics and was making this up as I went, so the geometry was super off, and to add insult to injury I epoxied in a steel nub on the end to be something to grab onto for mounting, since I didn't know how you're supposed to hold these. You're actually supposed to grab these by the working end and find nodal points and there's a whole finesse to it. At this point I also epoxied the transducer to the first insert. We gave the horn a test run, and even though the shape wasn't right yet, the horn did kind of work. We mixed a bit of WD-40 in water, which normally don't mix very well, and then stuck the ultrasonic tip into the mixture. When I pressed the tip gently on the side of the tube, it seemed to distort things just enough to get the vibrations closer to an actual resonant frequency, and some white emulsions started forming. But most of the 60 watts was just being lost to heat, so eventually the whole thing got too hot to hold. I also turned a little steel knife attachment, and while there were moments of it kind of doing a thing that seemed like it was cutting a bit better, for the most part it was really just underwhelming. I've got one more transducer left though, so I may take another swing at this in the future. At this point, I didn't think I was going to bother tuning this because I assumed it was a difficult process, so the horn was cleaned and brought into the lab for use. I tried homogenizing a spider with it, which actually worked okay, but then I tried some fluorescent E. coli and it didn't really do much. 
But recently, I found a video by Lindsay Wilson, which I've linked in the description, about tuning ultrasonic horns. It's actually way easier than I thought, and just requires an oscilloscope and frequency generator to get the basic job done. I'm not going to get into too much detail because I want you to go watch his video, but the basic idea is you set up the scope with two different channels. One channel is just listening to the raw output of the frequency generator, which is also connected to one side of the transducer. The other side of the transducer is connected to ground via a 100 ohm resistor, and the second probe channel is connected at the point between the resistor and transducer. Both probes are then connected to the same common ground. Now, ideally, you do this with a frequency generator that can produce a sine wave, as it makes this way easier. But mine only does square waves, so it took some tinkering to understand what I was looking at. We're looking for two things. First, we want the maximum amplitude on the channel connected to the output of the transducer. The input frequency that maximizes this amplitude is likely the resonant frequency as it's drawing the most current due to proper function. And then the other thing we're looking for is when the transducer's graph is nice and smooth, and lines up with the input signal graph. In my case, because it's a square-ish wave, this is what it looks like when that happens. You can see the transducer curve flattens out, and if I shift the frequency any lower, the graph pretty suddenly changes. The number in the top right of my scope shows the current frequency of the input signal, so when we hit this point, we can just read that number and know what the resonant frequency is. Okay, so now we know how to measure the horn, how do we actually tune it? Well, by and large, the majority of what changes the resonant frequency of a horn is its length, and the length of any of the different features in a horn. Since the driver I have works at about 40 kHz, we need to tune the horn to also have a resonant frequency of about 40 kHz. This means shrinking the length until this happens, taking little amounts off the end and then measuring over and over again. Remember that second horn I mentioned? I made a steel insert for it that was oversized at about 9 cm long. I had used the wavelength formula and the number I found for the speed of sound in steel to calculate one half of a wavelength at 40 kHz. Much like a radio antenna, a good horn should be about one half of a wavelength in total length, and any features should be about one quarter of a wavelength, as you can see from this diagram. The formula said half a wavelength should be about seven centimeters long, so by making the insert too long, I could shorten it until it hits resonance. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. When I first measured it, it was resonating at about 43 kilohertz, but by removing material, I was eventually able to bring it down to 40 kilohertz. Okay, now back to the fancier looking transducer. For the tuning process, first up I removed the steel nub I had added at the back, and that alone shaved 7 kHz off the resonant frequency. Then I ended up reshaping the main body a bit to be a bit more rounded and to take some weight off. Again, making it all up as I go, and mostly going for an aesthetically pleasing look while trying to find some balance between all three styles of horn using the material I had available. My current tool set, both literally and skill-wise, is pretty limited, so this seemed like the best option. I also removed the nub at the end where the tip screws in. At this point, with no tip, the horn was resonating too low, and I had actually overshortened it, but I had done that on purpose. My idea was to just make a longer tool to thread in here that it could be tuned to the right length, since it's easier to work with a normal rod of aluminum than this whole contraption which needed to be mounted between centers. So I did just that, and I made a new threaded insert out of aluminum, by first making the basic shape and threaded end, then making the 3.5mm probe end, which was shortened to length until the whole assembly resonated. Okay, now for the moment of truth, did these changes actually make a difference? Well, see for yourself. Here's the less complex horn and a tube of water with some kerosene on top. Almost the moment the ultrasound touches the mixture, an emulsion starts forming, and no need to deform the end. Next up, here's the fancy horn with the same test, but in a much smaller tube. Not only is the result different compared to the first attempt, it even sounds different, and the fluid gets violently mixed as soon as the probe touches the liquid. You can even see little fluid jets come flying off the end, or in moments when the horn is still on, a mist of aerosolized particles floating off the tip. What I find really interesting is the difference between both horns. They're both tuned to the same frequency, and while I haven't measured the gain directly, it's pretty clear that the horn with the smaller end diameter seems to homogenize things better. This makes sense as all the literature I've been reading seems to suggest that the gain is determined by how much the diameter of a horn is reduced at the working end. The exact amount of gain is determined by the shape of the horn, which is outside of my ability to really design right now. But in general, the pointier it is, the higher the gain. To close out this video, let's make some more emulsions. Here I've got your basic vinaigrette mix, which is just a mixture of balsamic vinegar and olive oil. You could say this is about to be the world's most precise vinaigrette. Again, as soon as the probe touches the liquid, things quickly get mixed. I also tried the same thing, but with sesame oil and water, which made a light beige mixture. Just for fun, I tried making reverse balsamic, where I inverted the ratio from 3 to 1 oil to vinegar to 1 to 3 oil to vinegar. You can see that no matter how hard I try, it just doesn't want to mix. It gets a bit cloudy, but it doesn't homogenize nearly as well. The two just separate out really quickly. 
I guess the pH must really inhibit emulsion formation. I also tried some safflower oil on water just to see what happens if you only use a very small amount of oil. The liquid does get cloudy but remains translucent unlike the others. The blue one is the same test but with some blue dye in the water. One note is that this only really works with things where you can get the probe to touch the interface between the two liquids. So when I tried making a much bigger batch of balsamic with the big probe, since I couldn't reach the liquid interface, no real mixing happened. And finally, a quick comparison between the horns. Here I've got a tiny amount of olive oil on the surface of some water. Both horns manage to homogenize things, but the smaller diameter horn seems to do a way better job. So I guess the only question now is, what else do I do with these? I still plan on using them for lab-specific tasks as I mentioned earlier, but if you've got other interesting things that can be done with a probe like this, let me know in the comments. Before I wrap up, I just want to take a moment to talk about the sponsor of this video, which is Audible. For all the hours in the lab pipetting or in the workshop filing away, I love having an audiobook playing as it makes the time fly by. And since it's the start of a new year, what better time to learn some new things, broaden your horizons, or maybe inspire you to try something new? Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, as well as Audible Originals, which are audio exclusives by storytellers from around the world. Get your first audiobook free when you try Audible for 30 days. Go to audible.com slash Thought Emporium, or if you're in the US, text Thought Emporium to 500-500 to get started. Right now I'm listening to Beyond Weird by Philip Ball, which I am absolutely loving. It's all about quantum mechanics and demystifying the mathematics to people who aren't physicists, while trying to avoid the usual cliches. So again, get your first audiobook free when you try for 30 days, and get started by heading over to audible.com slash Thought Emporium or text Thought Emporium to 500-500. Before we wrap up, this week's Nerd Thunder channels are Lindsay Wilson and This Old Tony. I've put links to both of their videos in the description. And that's where I'll end this video. If you enjoyed, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to see when I post new videos. Also, be sure to head over to my other social media pages, especially Instagram, to see these projects long before they end up in videos. And as always, a massive thank you to my amazing patrons and channel members who make these videos possible. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.